Good morning, everyone. Thank you for sparing your time this morning to join us at our spring grain market outlook. The past 12 months have been especially challenging for the arable market. Not only have we seen prices rapidly appreciating a year ago in light of the conflict in Ukraine, we've seen input prices rapidly increase and the effects of inflation across the agricultural supply chain. Since our Outlook conference in October, prices have started to move in a different trajectory. We've started to see a understanding of the supply and demand balance around the world, a, a normalization of a new way of operating, and a significant amount of grain that's been shipped out of the Black Sea. As such, prices have started moving lower, also at a point where inflation has started to continue to stay at strong levels. And so going forwards, there remains a significant challenge to the margins that our cereal and oilseed producers are facing. So it's a key point in the year to review where we're at in terms of markets, what's going to happen over the next few months and that longer term view. But also this morning, we're going to focus on a couple of um, bigger picture topics, that long term view is what's happening, specifically looking at SFI and new government support, as well as looking at carbon markets and how they're currently operating. Now, it would be remiss of me to not use this opportunity to highlight our planting and variety survey, which is due to go live on Thursday of this week. As ever, it is hugely important for the supply chain to understand the amount of crop that is planted in the ground. And it is hugely important for farmers to understand the amount of crop that's in the ground to be able to make those informed marketing decisions through the long term. So. I believe that my colleague uh, Meg has put the link in the chat for this meeting. Feel free to have, go and have a look at that once the, uh, once the conference is, is over. Please take a look later in the week. If it would be sparing five minutes of your time, please enter your details into that in terms of the crop that you are planting at the moment and what's already in the ground um, over winter so that we can help to create that bigger picture of what is likely to happen with domestic supply, demand and therefore prices through the next season. Not only is it useful for our levy payers, it's also extremely useful for government to understand what the forward look is as well as stakeholders as well. But back to here and today. The session for this morning is that um, we're going to go through a run through of the big things in the market. What's happening on a global scale? What's happening on a domestic scale? We'll then look at the SFI elements of things and then look at carbon markets. If we get a chance and we're running to time, we'll have a couple of questions in between those, um, those sessions, but we will be holding questions to the end. You can put questions in as we go through. I've already seen a couple drop into the, to the box um, as I've started, so feel free to put any questions in that you have. Now, um, if we could skip forward a couple of slides, if it's okay, I will hand over straight into our market outlook, go straight to Megan Hesketh, and we will go into the market outlook. So Meg, it is over to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. So if we could pop on one slide. Um, just before I start, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Megan Hesketh. I'm a senior analyst for Sirius Noel Seas here at the HDB. I'm going to run us through the grain market outlook. Um, and then I'm going to pass on to my colleagues, Anthony and Millie, who are going to take us through oil seeds as well as margins um, and input costs as well. So if we jump straight into the global outlook, um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So we're going to start off with taking a look at new season supply. So what can we expect from the new season? The new season starts in July. Um, and ultimately, how might that impact global price direction? I'm going to mainly concentrate on wheat and maize. Um, a lot of the key points that you know, we've got a good handle on you know, what we can um, foresee for the new season. Um, and also that'll be a good gauge for the overall grain price and, and market movement going forward. So as you can see on the map, um, I've highlighted some key regions that we're going to discuss today. Um, and we're going to discuss you know, what we can expect from the supply um, outlook. So if we start off with the EU, Canada, US and Argentina, they're all due pretty big grain crops. Um, if we start off with the EU specifically, you know, wheat supply is expected to be pretty heavy next season. Um, 
more, more of a market equilibrium for the barley and maize side. You know, EU production of soft wheat, barley, um, maize are all forecast up for harvest 2023. And conditions look good, um, with the exception of Spain, uh, which is in some pretty dry weather. A large supply is of wheat is expected to be carried forward into the new season as well. Um, quite a bit of grain has been imported from Ukraine into the EU, especially in those um, countries bordering Ukraine. Poland especially has seen some stock, you know, high stock building up, um, so we can be taking that forward into the new season as well. So looking at the US and Canada next, uh, they'll also forecast some large wheat crops as well on the higher area um, that they're expected to have. US maize also forecast an area increase of 4%, but Canada sounds slightly for the maize outlook. You know, US crop conditions, we've been talking about quite a bit recently because winter wheat especially has been pretty poor, um, but the area is very large. And I think so, something to know is that it isn't you know, a direct correlation we haven't seen of, of those really early on conditions um, and you know, how that links towards yield, although it's a really good indicator, you know, um the weather has turned favorable um now and is looking more favorable so it's certainly a watch point but really that area is due to be a big one for us wheat especially so we are expecting you know a, a relatively big crop um moving forward on to argentinian wheat as well you know that area is forecast up 10 percent um plus for the change in weather pattern expected from a La Nina to an El Nino, um, you know, what that means for potential rain across South America as well. So, you know, those are the sort of, those are areas that are expecting a production, um, you know, strong production. Let's have a quick look at those areas that are expected. It may be a reduction in production this time uh, for harvest 2023. Um, so if we take, firstly, a look at Russia, um, they do have planned production this time um, with total grain to um, account for 120 million tonnes. And that includes you know, planned production of around 80 to 85 million tonnes of wheat. Um, Russian consultancy ICAR peg um, wheat production for harvest 2023 at 84 million tonnes. So just to stress, even though that is you know, a smaller crop than harvest 2022, you know, last year's crop was a huge one, a wheat crop at 104 million tonnes. Um, you know, this is still to be a big crop um, and spring planting is progressing pretty well, um, but, you know, it is still due to be, you know, a relatively big crop, even though it is down slightly year on year. Ukraine, um, they are due reduced planted area and production um, for wheat, barley and maize across the board. Ukraine's Ministry of Agriculture is pegging wheat production yeah, around that 20% down year on year um, is forecast on you know, reduced planted area. Um, barley is forecast down around 17% year on year and maize around 11% year on year based on those area figures. And then finally, Australia remains a really key watch point. Um, some sources are suggesting that that area you know, could be big, but yeah, a big watch point is the El Nino, um, whereas it's a watch point on the Argentinian side for more rain, you know, we could see some dry weather across our Australia, um, and so what that will mean for production. So let's summarise, you know, what does all of this mean for price direction um, for global grain markets? Well, you know, from what we've heard and from what we've talked about just now, you know, overall wheat carrying stocks are expected to be higher heading into the new season, um, combined with a relatively large production outlook, you know, bar in Ukraine, um, you know, a relatively large supply from those carrying stocks plus some large crops. Um, you know, supply does look to be there for the new season. Maize production is also forecast to rebound you know, globally, uh, and that'll also weigh on that outlook going forward with you know, supply definitely there. So there are some watch points to remain um, really key and you know, at the forefront of our minds. You know, the war in Ukraine is ongoing and the Black Sea Initiative it is due to be renewed next month, mid-May. Um, there has been quite a few concerns about whether it will be renewed um, based on 
Russia needs to come to a deal with the UN and Ukraine. Um, and there has been a lot of talk about it potentially, you know, concerns of it not being renewed. Um, but, you know, certainly whether this Black Sea initiative will be renewed in mid-May will definitely be key for grain availability next season. Uh, and plus new season demand, you know, the demand outlook for the new season, um, whether we could see you know, rebound in some areas, especially as we're, you know, expecting lower average um, prices for the new season from this from this season um, just about to end. And of course, the weather. I think it's pretty important to remember as a key driver in grain prices. I've been seeing quite a lot of this recently. You know, the market um, has been moving really heavily on geopolitics. Uh, it seems like we're moving back to the fundamentals. You know, geopolitics will still, you know, remain in the background and still be really key. But, you know, really moving on the fundamentals of the market into the new season. Please, could we have the next slide? Brilliant, thank you very much. So now if we move on to the, our domestic outlook specifically, I really think the key message here is, you know, especially for wheat, we're going to be relatively well supplied uh, into the new season. As you can see on the graph on the left hand side, uh, domestic wheat opening stocks are currently forecast to be the largest since 2016-17. Um, this number may change slightly. Um, because it is a forecast for the end of the season. But I think the sentiment really remains is that, you know, um, we're going to have quite a bit of carry into the new season is expected. Um, and questions remain about, you know, when this wheat is going to be sold um, that might be carried into the new season. And could this pressure harvest price? Um, so all really uh, new key things to think about. As you can see in the graph on the right hand side, um, domestic production is forecast to be you know, pretty well supplied. Uh, we saw some pretty strong winter cropping again this time. Um, the conditions were there. Uh, for anyone who'd like to see, we've got our early bird survey figures uh, of those plantings and planting intentions. And this is what the projections are based on. Um, I do think, especially for the total barley, you know, we could see some shifts from this. Um, we have heard that some failed OSR has been re-sown um, to spring barley. Um, so, you know, that'll definitely be something to think about in terms of that total area of barley and you know, potentially um, what that might mean for production. Um, but those are, you know, the overall scenarios that we're, we're having, that we're looking at at the moment. In terms of conditions domestically, you know, pretty good. You know, the weather remains a key watch point, um, especially, you know, for the delay of spring planting and weather remains a watch point as we move towards harvest. Uh, generally, we're understanding, you know, winter grains look like they have the potential to deliver good yields. Um, on the winter barley side, you know, there are some watch points around disease pressure, considering net blotch and rhincosporium with the, the wet weather that we've seen. Um, but, you know, overall conditions um, and the potential is there to deliver those good yields. So let's have a summary of the things we've just talked about domestically. You know, into the new season, looks like the carry is going to be substantial. Um, you know, and expecting for the new season as well. You know, relatively large production. Um, so the supply is looks to be there. I think demand will certainly remain a watch point. You know, like on the global scale. We, Domestically, we've seen pretty lackluster demand this season. Um, so, you know, what impact that might have next season. Um, but I think in terms of price direction, you know, the key things to take away, you know, for the remainder of this season, as we move towards July, you know, we, we might see a bit of volatility in the run up to you know, the mid-May renewal of the Black Sea Initiative. Um, overall, you know, global movements over the past couple of months, as, as David said, you know, still seeing quite a bit of pressure from cheap Black Sea supplies, uh, pulling those global prices down. So that's certainly in the background. And then looking ahead to new season, you know, supply is uh, looks to be large supply domestically uh, in the EU with you know, relatively um, large forecasted carrying stocks and you know, pretty decent crops. So the really the fundamentals point to you know, a more bearish outlook for the new season. So that's the summary of the grain side. I'm now going to pass over to Anthony, who's going to um, take us through oil seeds market outlook. Thanks, Meg, for that. Um, uh, for that grain insight too, that was really interesting. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony, and I'll be talking you through a, an oil seed outlook. 
So a lot has changed for oilseed prices over the last year. And even in recent months, rapeseed prices have been um, pressured quite a bit. And that was the general conclusion from our outlook um, last November. Um, can we have the um, next slide, please? So to start with, I want to start with a conclusion. Oilseed markets are relatively well supplied. And on paper, at the minute, there doesn't seem to be any market information that was will take us back up to the highs that we have had um, over the last 12 months. So this map here is just a quick whistle stop tour of what will be driving X farm rapeseed prices over the next um, six to 12 months. And as we can visually see, the bears outweigh the bulls. So to start with, um, we've got the focus at the minute on uh, the Canadian canola crop and their plantings, which are currently in focus um, on the prairies. Stat can um, estimate uh, production for this crop at 18 and a half um, million tonnes. This is assuming normal crop abandonment of area and trend yields and normal weather and growing conditions have been assumed for the moment. We turn our attention then towards US soybeans. And as we can see, there's been an increased area and provisionally they have the potential to produce a record soybean crop. So this has been in response um, to prices and demand um, from the US biofuel industry, um, where demand seems to have grown um, unfazed. Currently right now, focus for new crop is on maize plantings, but over the next few weeks, um, soybean plantings in the US will start to, to ramp up and markets will react accordingly to weather. And we're seeing that at the moment, everyday prices change depending on what happens uh, with uh, North American weather. So we turn our attention to the Southern Hemisphere. We've got uh, South America. We've had a third successive La Nina uh, weather event, which significantly impacted um, Argentina, and they've had the worst drought um, in 60 years. And that, to some extent, has kept soybean prices afloat. And also before the La Nina event actually happened, um, there was that risk premium priced in too. However, Brazil have just harvested a record um, soybean crop, and there's many agricultural consultancies that are putting this crop over 150 million tonnes, um, which is a record. And this annual increase, for the most part, has accounted for the huge loss that we have seen um, in Argentina. So this crop is currently being exported to the market, which is reducing Brazilians' uh, port premiums and will inherently, to some extent, could weigh on soybean prices as they um, export this crop. The focus for new crop will be at the end of um, this year, and the weather outlook is pointing to improved conditions um, for the continent, as my colleague Meg mentioned. We are transitioning from a La Nina to an El Nino um, weather, uh, weather pattern, which will bring more rains to um, South America and alleviate uh, the drought concerns, notably in Argentina. And this leads us on to our next point. For Australia, the opposite is going to happen. Um, at the end of this year, there's going to be drier weather in Australia. And currently, Abares are factoring that into their um, estimates. And they're estimating the new crop, uh, Australian canola crop, at 5.4 million tonnes. This is still quite a large crop. But when you compare it to the record crop of 8.3 million tonnes, which has just been harvested and exported, it doesn't seem so big. So this could be the one thing that is a partial sentiment changer um, on rapeseed relative premium or discount to oil seeds as we approach the end of 2023. And then obviously, if we see large revisions to that, we could see the premium increase. But that is all dependent on what happens. But that's just a watch point as we transition to this El Nino and could be one of the implications of the El Nino weather event. In the EU, supplies are going to bear on our domestic market. Um, EU oilseed production for new crop is going to grow a um, significant amount. Also, consumption for vegetable oils in the EU is being affected by high inflation at the moment. Uh, meal consumption is uh, being impacted, which has been to a reduction in animal feed demand and the impacts of AI. So the reduction in consumption will inherently add to the ending stocks for this marketing year and will just lead into um, 
uh, higher or larger carrying stocks for the next marketing year and that combined with this large production uh, just spells bearishness um, for oil seed markets. So just touching up on Ukraine, we had early reports at the start of this marketing year that there was going to be an increased amount of oil seeds um, in the country. Um, this was due to uh, due to margins and also the geographical location of where um, these these oil seed commodities are grown uh, within the country. The provisional data is pointing to an uptick of all major oil seeds uh, in Ukraine um, for annual increases for sunseed, soybeans, and and for rapeseed as well. And, and the, provisionally, they're going to produce 3.7 million tons of rapeseed and export three and a half million tons of that for the next marketing year, which will largely be absorbed probably by the EU. So again, re-emphasizing how um, that could add to this, this bearish outlook. So the general consensus, <clears throat> as I just said at the start, the bears outweigh um, the bulls for the moment. And if we could have the next slide, please. And um, we can now talk about well, what does this mean for my rate sheet price? So obviously, last grain market outlook, November, Rapeseed prices were around £500 per tonne delivered into Erif, but bearish fundamentals um, have outweighed the bulls, and that combined with the ease in crude oil prices over the last um, few months means that delivered prices are now sitting around £400 um, per tonne mark. I personally cannot see us getting back to £500 per tonne, and that's notwithstanding, obviously, any major weather event. I mentioned the El Nino, um, and also we're approaching northern north american uh, weather market too and also if there's seismic changes or shifts or uh, reignition to uh, the war between uh, russia and ukraine and you know as meg mentioned earlier this this is still an active war and to some extent is an underpinning to markets but we are seeing markets now focus more on the fundamentals so uk crop conditions um in our our reports are showing that they improved on the year um, nationally and if we take into account our early bird survey we are domestically going to produce a rapeseed tr crop between 1.15 to 1.6 million tons but this what I will note is dependent on yields and area so the calculation is taken from our early bird survey which was intentions um, as at November but as we know there's been a, a degree of, of damage crop loss from pests um, and that's why I'm going to shamelessly promote our plant and variety survey again. That's why it's important to to get the most accurate data we can by filling out um, that information. Then we can get um, an accurate figure for our rapeseed harvest for for this coming harvest. So all in all, conclusions are we're going to have larger use supplies. This is going to weigh on on rapeseed prices, and the only thing that is really going to really going to change sentiment um, will be if there are any major weather events from the El Nino or uh, any um, changes within uh, Russia and Ukraine between um, the war between the two countries. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'm going to pass over to uh, my colleague Millie who will um, take on from now. Thank you Millie. Thanks very much Ant. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Millie Askew, um, the lead analyst in the Cereals and All Seeds team. So we've heard about the likely price direction of grain and oilseed markets over the coming season, um, but what about input costs and the impact on margins? So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to take a look at the direction of um, fertilizer prices going forward, as well as what impact high input costs have had on gross margins for the 2023 crop, and then what you as a grower can do to help improve performance on farm, to reduce overheads and improve um, the break-even point. So next slide, please. So to assess fertilizer price, um, the fertilizer price situation, um, we need to look at what is happening in natural gas markets, as natural gas makes up um, around 60 to 80 percent of fertilizer production costs. Um, and as you can see by the two charts here, um, fertilizer prices tend to track natural gas quite closely. So natural gas prices reached their all-time peak in August 2022 before dropping back down um, with some support again in November and December time off the back of colder weather. Um, since then, though, we have um, seen natural gas prices come down and they're currently, um, with UK nearby natural gas features currently sitting um, just under the 100 pence per firm mark, which is pre-war levels, as you can see um, here on the chart. 
Since the loss of the supply um, from Nord Stream 1, Europe have become more reliant on liquid natural gas or LNG. So prices have um, been coming down of late as Europe have built up um, a good supply of LNG as well as a relatively mild winter across Europe this winter. And here in the UK, we've actually become um, slightly more reliant on wind power to generate electricity over using gas. The supplies are looking quite good for this time of year. Looking further ahead, um, and where could natural, price, natural gas prices go? Um, with Europe uh, becoming more reliant on LNG, it um, now means we are facing greater competition from Asian markets who also have high demand for liquid natural gas. We are yet to see much of that competition um, on the market from Asia for liquid natural gas, but when we do, it's likely um, there will be some added volatility back into natural gas markets. So um, as it stands at the moment, it's unlikely, um, especially if we have another cold winter next year or um, later this year, we will see natural gas prices um, completely drop back down below sort of the pre-pandemic levels of 40 pence per therm as such. So bringing this back to fertiliser prices, um, we have seen fert prices come back down over recent months and in March, um, According to the HDBGB um, fertilizer price series, UK produced um, ammonium nitrate for spot delivery averaged £465 um, per tonne, which is down £166 per tonne from February's levels. Um, and it's also um, £374 per tonne lower than levels recorded in March 2022. Um, however, I mean, the latest March price um, still remains um, nearly £200 per tonne higher than levels recorded in March 2021 pre-war levels. So looking further ahead, um, with natural gas prices continuing um, to come down over recent months, it's likely fertiliser prices will follow suit or continue to follow suit. Um, however, with the volatility likely to remain in natural gas prices with competition from Asia for liquid natural gas, etc., it's unlikely we will see fertiliser prices come back down um, to sort of the lower levels we saw um, pre the invasion of Ukraine, in at least the short term anyway. Uh, next slide, please. So we've looked at where fertilizer prices are going, but what impact have the high input costs had on gross margins for the 2023 crop? Um, I just want to start off with some information around these calculations um, on this slide um, and the gross margins shown here and highlight that these um, gross margins are calculations based off analysis um, and data sources. These are not based off specific farm type or a group of farms. Um, however, they do give you an idea of how margins have been impacting by, um, by differing output and input costs. So you've got the top um, chart there showing um, gross margins for harvest 2023 and the bottom chart there showing gross margins for harvest 2022. So with a large portion of fertilizer bought in May, June time, um, the FERC cost for both 2022 and 2023 crop margins are an average of um, these from the previous year. So for 2022, the average AN price used um, was £291 per tonne, while for 2023, the average AN price was more than double that at £737 per tonne. And then the average commodity prices used in these calculations, just for continuity purposes, are based off the same time frame. So um, they're actually the 12-week average um, cereal price from late April backwards and for oilseed rate for the four-week average. So meaning um, for 2022, the prices um, using these gross margins hadn't even reached those um, 300 plus pounds per tonne level um, and didn't take into account that huge jump up in May. So as you can see, all crops, um, for all crops, the gross margins are lower this year. Um, and so is the pound per output per um, pounds for variable costs. I think most interestingly, the rankings of some of the top crops have shifted significantly with winter oilseed rape dropping from um, sort of using the calculations we've used, dropping from the top ranking space and gross margins all the way down um, second from the bottom this season. Um, winter wheats are obviously still faring well in terms of rankings, but with substantially lower margins um, and pound per um, output per pound of um, variable costs. Um, as mentioned, these are somewhat scenarios. Ultimately, when fertiliser was purchased and how much you paid for it, as well as when and, um, and how much for you sold your grain, um, will play a big factor in what individual gross margins will be per enterprise. That said, um, with high input costs and grain prices on the downward trajectory, as we've just heard, um, 
there has never been a more important time to understand your cost of production as a grower and how to reduce overheads to improve the break even point. Next slide, please. So, there's never been a more important um, time to improve performance. Um, you often hear growers being grouped into um, the bottom. 25% um, mid 50% and top 25% tiers like when we're talking about analysis and even in the toughest of times the top 25% tend to still be profitable due to their farming practices. So what makes um, a top 25% grower? Um, these eight factors tend to differentiate the top performers from the mid and the bottom performers. So if we start off with uh, minimising overheads, higher output accounts for just um, 10 to 30 percent of higher profits in top quartile farms businesses but lower costs contribute 65 to 90 percent setting um, goals and budgets farms that intentionally um, carry out farm um, business management practices are considerably more profitable particularly at individual business level so for high performing businesses are likely to set ambitious and long-term goals undertake market um, management accounting including budgeting, you know, using comparative data, um, including um, benchmarking, um, farm bench, seek information advice through means including farm visits and paid advisors, et cetera, interact with um, customers, so those who are actually buying um, their product from farm, and adopt uh, more formal risk management strategies. And I think, again, just the compare yourself with others and gather information, the benchmarking. So more than half of farmers operating in the bottom um, sort of quartile do not realise they are underachieving. So suggesting the benefit really there of benchmarking um, or other sort of comparable analysis, um, which could be tremendous for an enterprise. So understanding the market, um, what we do here. So the value of interacting uh, with the person likely to buy your goods um, on farm is higher than ever. So knowing exactly what to produce might be a relatively straightforward conversation or it could be highly complex. But recognising what is of sort of the greatest value to them is critical to adding value to both parties um, and to keep costs down. So focusing on the details. So studies have identified um, that there is no single action that the best farmers do that is completely different from others. They tend to be better at most processes throughout the farm. Once the farm structure is correct, the attention to detail of every aspect of farming makes a cumulative difference. So also, I think, um, again, another important point is the mindset for change and um, innovation. So positive attitude, um, and farmers who considered um, they had control over their destiny um, were free to make their own decisions and therefore also held responsibility for errors or losses that were incurred. Continually improving um, people management. So as a farm grows, there, continue, um, there comes a point when the um, farmer cannot personally do everything themselves. So employing staff becomes a necessity. A labour force um, provides the opportunity to leverage somebody's time as debt leverages cash or rented land leverages an owned land base. And then lastly, specialised. Farms that concentrate on doing one farm system rather than um, many tend to be um, more profitable. Um, it focuses the mind and prevents distractions and fewer enterprises gather fewer overheads. So to summarise really, the past couple of years have been somewhat unprecedented as we all know. Um, with the pandemic and then leading into the Black Swan event of um, the invasion of Ukraine. So with the stark changes to subsidies coming um, and a level of uncertainty remaining in markets um, with the ongoing war um, in Ukraine and a number of weather events sort of on the horizon, there has never been a more important time to evaluate, evaluate your um, farm business to improve overheads, um, benchmark against others um, and to improve performance. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Amandeep, who's going to explore the new SFI scheme. Thanks very much, Millie. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Amandeep. I'm a senior analyst in the trade and policy team. And thanks for joining us today. So as you're all aware that in England, reduction in direct payments started in 2021. Next year, they will be down to 50% of the original level um, which um, farmers received. And in five years time, they'll be gone altogether. So how can that gap, which is substantial for many farmers, how can that be filled? 
Uh, we're going to be looking at this um, today and over the next 20 minutes or so with a particular focus on SFI and countryside stewardship. So we'll start with covering the latest information available and we'll, cover, we'll start with covering the latest information available, um, which is um, was being announced um, in January, and they'll be using the HDB virtual farms to look at some examples which show how farm business finance, finances could be impacted. We'll finish then by looking at so what does this tell us and look, draw out the key messages and take home points from the analysis and what you know what kind of things do we need to think about going forward. So I'll start off with um, looking at the um, ELM scheme, so environmental land management schemes. So in England, the reduction in direct payments has been used to fund these environmental land management schemes or ELMs under the new domestic policy where public money for public goods is at the heart of the whole policy. So it's about improving the environment and providing environmental benefits. There's three components of ELMs. The Sustainable Farming Incentive or the SFI, if you click through please, that rewards farmers for carrying out sustainable farming practices on their farm. The SFI pilot, could you click through please? So the SFI pilot started towards the end of 2021. There's 850 farmers taking part. The wider rollout, rollout began in 2022, and that's, that showed a limited offering of just a few standards, but it was open to all farmers who were eligible to take part, who were eligible, to, eligible for the basic payment scheme. The countryside stewardship, we know this is an existing agri-environmental scheme. Um, if you click through, please. So the plan going forward is to extend the original scope of this scheme and pay for a wider range of targeted and specific actions. So this second tier was originally going to be called um, the Local Nature Recovery Scheme, but it's been decided since then to evolve Countryside Stewardship instead of having a new scheme. Countryside Stewardship Plus kind of brings in a key element of the now sort of defunct um, Local Nature Recovery Scheme because it, it will fund actions that farmers or land managers can do in collaboration to bring about local benefits. Landscape recovery is about large scale, longer term, um, land use change projects so there's um it's for all landowners not just for farmers national parks can take part um it's a competitive application round so you have to bid put a project in and if you're chosen to be successful then you can take um take part get the funding there's currently 22 projects um that are in place at the moment covering over 40,000 hectares and they're kind of their main focus on restoring rivers and providing habitats the second round of applications is going to be opening soon, and that's going to focus on net zero habitat creation and protected sites. We've worked with Harper Adams University to look at the landscape recovery scheme in detail. So here we've spoken to farmers who have taken part to see why do they do it, how it's, how it's been going for them, and the costs and benefits involved. We also spoke to those who actively decided against um, getting involved, and what were their reasons behind that. And this work will be published next month, so keep an eye out for that for more insight. But the key point here, if you click on please, is that these schemes are not intended to be a like-for-like -like replacement for direct payments. They alone are highly unlikely to um, fill the funding gap. If you click on please, and next slide please. So in the SFI at the moment, there are three standards on offer. The two so um, soil standards that you can see there, arable and horticultural soils, um, improved grass and soils and the moorland standard. Click on please. In 2023, um, in January, there um, six new six additional standards were announced in January this year. Um, so you can see them there. For example, we've got hedgerows, IPM, nutrient management, um, arable and horticultural grass uh, land, and the, there's two grassland standards in there as well. If you click on please, there's also an SFI management payment whereby you get an annual payment for £20 per hectare for the first 50 hectares of your land um, that you enter into the SFI. And that works out as a maximum of £1,000 a year. And this was really introduced as um, to recognise the cost and the time that farmers incur when they're doing the applications for SFI and other administration that's related to it. Um, we did a detailed piece of work for the SFI last year in collaboration with Harper Adams University and went, you know, involved um, interviewing farmers that were taking part and this is a recurrent theme that was brought up by their feedback. So we highlighted this to DEFRA, fed this back, and it's good to see that some of these steps have been taken to recognise this and make things uh, improve things for farmers. Next slide, please. 
Right, so let's look at these um, new standards in a bit more detail now. So there's an important difference between the current standard and the additional six standards that have been announced. So for the current standards, example, I've got the Arabian Horticultural Soil Standard here. They, they are packages and they've got two ambition levels. Um, so, and you need to complete all the actions under each level to get that payment. So if we take the Arabian Horticultural Soils here, under the introductory level, you've got to do the um, soil organic matter test. You've got to do the management plan provide green cover over winter and add the organic matter to get that payment of £22 per hectare for however much land you enter into the standard. Then if you increase your ambition and go up to the intermediate level um, to get that payment of £40 per hectare, you've got to do everything in the introductory level plus that extra bit of having green cover over the winter, which includes a 20%, you know, a multi-species cover crop over 20% of that area. So in 2023, if you click on please, um, it's a bit of a pick and mix really. Um, you can choose different actions under different standards. So is this, in this table here, I've just shown some of the new standards. I haven't got all of the actions for each standard they're showing there just because of space issues. But just to illustrate, for example, the hedgerow standard has three different actions underneath it. Um, one is to you know, maintain and assess and record condition, manage hedgerows to different heights and widths. And one is to look at um, maintaining or growing hedgerow trees but so you've got the choice really you can do all three of those um, options under the hedgerow standard or you can just choose one or two it's all, th all three of them it's really take your pick as i said take uh, go pick a mix you've got that flexibility of these standards or you could do one from the hedgerow one action from the hedgerow standard one from ipm one from the agricultural horticultural land so compared to before with the packages in terms of the true soil standards there's a lot more leeway and flexibility, I'd say, in the way that the new um, 2023 standards have been developed. Next slide, please. So farmers can take part in the SFI and countryside stewardship at the same time, as long as the actions are compatible um, with each other and not being paid twice to do the same thing on the same bit of land. Um, in terms of compatibility, it's like um, the things to consider, I do the timings work. So, for example, if you're required to have a cover crop planted over a certain period, does that interfere with anything else that you've got in another agreement? Um, if we look, at, I'm going to look at a specific example here, which is um, under the SFI, under the arable and horticultural land standard, one action is to establish or maintain blocks or strips of pollen and nectar flower mix, and that pays £614 per hectare. And there's a very, there's a similar action, the countryside stewardship um, AB1 which is pretty much to provide the same thing, is to provide food for pollinators and encourage natural crop predators. So they've got the same payment rates, pretty much the same same aim, same kind of action. So you won't be able to do that, do both of these on the same plot of land because you'll be paid twice to do the same thing. If you click on please, there are some similarities in terms of if you look at the details here. The similarities between these two, um, the SFI and this AB1 CS option, is that you know the type of seed mix to use, so here, They've both got to be grass free and contain at least um, six flower species. But if we there are if we don't click on the next bit, please, um, there are some um, differences. So under the prohibited actions, there's a bit more leeway under SFI because it just says that don't cut or uh, graze it with livestock so that the actions aims can't be achieved. Whereas under the um, countryside stewardship guidance, it specifically says not to graze the land between 15th of March and 31st of August. So I'd say there's a bit more flexibility in SFI. You've got a bit more discretion there. As long as your aim is being achieved, there's not like a fixed date that you have to um, subscribe to. And also, you need to for, uh, you need to keep it established about the whole agreement. So for SFI, it's a three-year agreement, and for the countryside stewardship, it's going to be there to the end of your five-year agreement. So really, the devil's in the detail. When you're going to look at through these things, look at the small print, look at the guidance notes, and see what's going to work for you, and see um, what makes sense for your farm, really. In terms of um, preventing sort of double counting, uh, so you don't end up putting similar action in the same bit of line, I think there's going to, the application process is going to be designed in such a way to automatically stop you from doing that. So I think they'll have like a, a map or a grid of your farm, when if you've entered a certain bit of land for, for example, if you just gave here for the nectar and flower mix under SFI, you won't, you won't be able to enter the same bit of land for um, AB1, for example. So that should help sort of alleviate any sort of, um, um, issues there. Now, um, if you move on to the next slide, please, we'll have a look at what does actually what does it actually mean for farm businesses? 
So I'm going to look at this using examples, using our virtual farms, of course, um, virtual farms or farms in a spreadsheet, really, which are designed to be typical farms. So they're not top performing farms, they're in the middle 50%. Their physical performance is comparable to nat nat um, national average, um, regional averages, and their costs tend to be higher than what you'd find in top performing farms. So we've got three arable farms in our sort of our, um, virtual farm catalogue, a mixed farm, two beef and sheep farms, and there's a new new addition of a dairy farm, which we've just developed a couple of, about six months ago, really. And the ones we're going to focus on here is the arable farm in the east of England, 455 hectares, um, and the mixed farm, um, 220 hectares, which is set in the Yorkshire and Humber. Just for those of you which might have some livestock on your farm, we can look at some different options there as well. So if you go to the next slide, please. So what we're going to do here is that we'll look at different options, how you can stack these um, SFI and countryside stewardship um, standards together and see what they mean for you on your farm and farmer's bottom line. So an option one here of deliberately chosen standards or actions where there's a minimal change, there's a minimal change rather in terms of the farm setup. So it's not too onerous. I've chosen things such as, you know, um, have, you know, set up a, IPM plan or do a nutrient management plan, maintain your hedgerows, for example. You'll see all these come up in shortly when we put the graph up. Um, there's, as it's a three year agreement, um, SFI is a three year agreement, we've worked out the total payment and the costs over the three years. The payment rate, so the total payment rate is going to be the same over the three years because we've just kept the area the same for any given standard. But some of the costs will differ. So, for example, in the arable and horticultural soil standard, in year one, you're um, expected to do a soil, um, so, nitrogen soil test, organic matter soil test and assessment. Um, so, and you don't have to repeat that every year. So obviously the costs will be higher in year one compared to years two or year three. And we've also looked, we've got different areas of land for different standards, depending on what, what worked best for in the circumstances of the model farms. And to um, just to reiterate again, so we've take back, taken into account that um, the costs involved in doing these actions. So the payments you'll see in a bit, if you click blue now, um, the payments that you see on the graph will be net payments, um, which because of the costs have been taken into account. Can you click through please to show the graph? Thank you. So here, what this is showing in the blue bars here, we've got the direct payments from the farm. So going, obviously they're falling from year to year because of the reduction in direct payments. And then the sort of colored blocks at the top is the payment, the total payment we're getting from doing these various actions that I've chosen, these sort of less onerous actions. For example, um, well, we've got the SFI management fee in there, or, um, payment in there already of thousand pounds per year. And then we've got arable horticultural source intermediate level I've chosen, we have IPM, hedgerows, and the nutrient management standard in terms of like creating a nutrient management plan. And what we can see from these additional actions, from these SFI options, we're getting roughly about an extra 14 to 15,000 pounds from doing these actions on this farm, which is about 20% boost in year one, a 30% increase in year three. So again, it's not a like for like replacement. It's showing that it's not, you know, directly re replace, um, it's not plugging that gap of the removal of direct payments, but it's making some, some sort of, um, giving a slight boost. Go to the next slide, please. So what does this mean for the overall farm business? So how does, and then how does taking part in the SFI with these options that were chosen, how does that affect the farm's net um, bottom line or their net profit? And by the net profit, I mean the total revenue minus the total cost. So what we've done here, because we want to look at the effect of taking part in the SFI or not taking part, part in it, we've kept everything else constant. So yields, price, et cetera, been kept constant because we don't want things muddling things um, in terms of, you know, we just want to see the effect of the SFI. So in the green, we've got the net profit of the farm without having SF. If you don't take part in these SFI options, leave it as it is and just have the reduction of direct payments and keep everything else the same. And in the blue bar, it's what you what the net profit would be if you were doing these options for the overall farm. And you can see a small increase between three to four percent over the three years. Move on to the next slide, please. So here now we're going to be a bit more ambitious and be a bit more ambitious actions. So the kind of things I've included here um, kind of includes actions which require taking land out of production. So under the integrated um, pest management option, I've included the action which where you have to grow a flower rich grass, mar grass margin. And under nutrient management, I've included the option of having a legume fallow, for example. 
I've also included all the actions from the arable and horticultural land standard, as well as some countryside stewardship options. Again, these are net payments, so the costs have been factored in, and we can see a boost um, in terms of the payments received. So again, your blue bars there, the ones at the bottom, are direct payments going down, and then the coloured bars is the kind of boost you're getting from in terms of payment rates received by doing these various SFI CS options. And in terms of total payment received, the boost payments, you're looking between an extra 42 to 50 to 52,000 pounds. So in year two and in years two and year three, they're actually the additional money you're getting from SFI and countryside stewardship is actually more than double the amount that you'd be getting from you more than double the amount of your direct payment value. Move to the next slide, please. So again, what does this mean for your bottom of the bottom of this net of this um, farm? Now again, we've got the green bar, which is um, looking at without SFI. The green bar and the blue is the same what we've seen before. So the green bar is without SFI. Blue is if you're doing those simple options, and then the yellow bar, um, the third bar there, is what we're seeing now. We could do these more ambitious actions. And overall, we've seen like a loss in the first year, five percent, and then minus 1% in the other, other years. So over average is actually about 3% overall. And that's because we have to take land up production to do some of these actions, like establish various margins or pollinator mixes or bird food areas, et cetera. Um, but what we've got to bear in mind here, and this is a big caveat, is that obviously these are these farms are just on a spreadsheet and Excel file. Um, it's got to have a bit of a blanket approach. So if I want to take land up for production to do a certain of these um, agri-environmental schemes on it, I just have to treat everything constant or like have to apply the same thing to everywhere. Whereas in reality, you could use the unproductive areas of your farm. So you, it's not going to be too much of your to your detriment, really. Um, so I think if you've got the setup to accommodate some of these other more ambitious actions, then it's a bit of a no brainer in terms of the extra payment that you receive. Go to the next um, slide, please. So I'm just going to quickly look at um, a mixed farm for those of you who may have livestock or grass and this is an opportunity here to look at some of the grass and options. So here we've got improved, um, improved grass and soils, improved grass and, and soil standard and improved grass and standard and a CS option um, included into that. So and, um, what we have under integrated pest management option that, um, standard which I chose as you can see in the, amongst, in the key there. Um, is that there was an, there's an action there to establish or maintain legumes, uh, but when when I was doing the calculation, this is something that I think when you're going through this, is something to bear in mind. So I think it highlights you know the detail of the kind of um, what you need to be aware of is that the cost of doing the action was actually more than I was going to get paid per hectare, so I decided to just leave it out. So again, that's what the beauties of this kind of new style where you can take your pick from different options from different standards if something's not really going to work for your farm then just, you're not under no obligation to do that bit if it's not right for you so i decided to include it into this bit of the analysis it's just something to consider just something to highlight so what's happening overall is that the, again the blue bars are um, what you receive from direct payments and the colored ones as before is what you get from the various different options you can see on the screen there from um, sfi and countryside stewardship and you get a boost of around between 26 to 29,000 pounds under these circumstances. And again, by the end of the year, in the year 2024 and 2025, that's more than double the amount you're actually receiving from direct payments. Next slide, please. So we now we've turned to see what this means for the bottom of the farm. And again, as we saw before for the arable farm, the green bars are showing what um, the net profit of the farm is before you did any of these. SFI or countryside stewardship standards. And so the farm is making a loss even before, it's making a loss anyway. So you can see that you know, negative sort of net profit going from 2023 to 2025. What these sort of SFI payments, um, countryside stewardship payments have done in this case here is that they've kind of mitigated the effect of that. They've alleviate, alleviated it. So where we'd be making a loss, they've actually turned it into a, uh, into a gain. And in, in 2025, for example, it, that additional payment there is just about helping the farm break even. We go to next slide, please. So I just want to finish off with sort of the key take-home points from all of this, and I bang on about this point again. But as we said before, the elms is not designed to be um, a like-for-like -like replacement. We've seen that in the graphs that we've seen in the analysis here. That there's no one action that's going to help plug that gap. We need a variety of different things to help do that. Um, we looked at options 
if you click on please, if you look at options that were best for the farm, um, and they were relatively, relatively simple to do to help alleviate some of that loss. But we saw that being more ambitious provided higher payments and they plugged that gap a bit. They didn't just plug it, actually, they, they did fill that gap. Um, but in terms of the overall business, we made a loss due to land being taken out of production. But again, there is that caveat. If you've got bits of your farm to unproductive land, then you can make that work for you. Um, and it just depends on how it will depend from farm to farm. Also, as um, next year, there'll, probably more, there'll be plans to introduce more standards. There'll be plans to introduce more standards going forward um, and become more available. So you can add those to the agreement and that will you know, help you add, pro 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 provide further income. The flexibility also means that you can start off small and build up in terms of the ambition because you've got that flexibility but on year by year they've introduced this element as well where you can increase the amount of land you've got in the SFI on a yearly basis if it's going well and you can um, increase your ambition level so you can put more standards in and you can um, go from maybe an introductory level intermediate level if you're in, the, in those kind of packages but you just can't go back in the reverse direction so you can start off small if you're not sure and then build up so that you can actually basically capitalize and make the most of what's on offer um, through the schemes the other strand that's shown up here is um, increase the overall product, overall productivity and efficiency of your business. And this is really building up, building up what Millie just talked about in her presentation. So it's like getting them more out of your farm, um, improving, improving the performance, get more out, get more out compared to what you put in. And that doesn't necessarily mean increase your yields and increase your production. It means increasing them without increasing your input costs. So lower input, but yet the same amount out. Or you create the same amount, but you do it with lower inputs going in and there's grants available to help with this the farm investment fund um, has got um, you know got various grants on tech, um, machinery or other kind of aspects which could help with that techno technology um, advances and that so you can help that um, put that into practice on your farm and the work that we did on the characteristics of top performing farmers Midi's taking you through the sort of the eight characteristics earlier is also relevant here because you know what kind of things can you do which she's going into a bit more detail is what kind of things can you do to move your make move your make your business go towards that level if you just click um click on please Maya for the next um, bit the arrow to farm so in the long term um SFI and countryside stewardship actions will should will ultimately help to improve the productivity on farm because it, they should improve your soil health etc and they will provide those benefits that um will over, you know be advantageous for you to your business overall because it reduce the need for fertilizers for example so it really does work hand in hand it, it, if done well and um, done and it works well ultimately you will be increasing your productivity via these sort of sustainability um, practices if you click on please Maya we also it's also about looking at other um, sources of income as an option um, so some you know some, lots of people may choose to, um, may, you may choose to diversi diversify and this is really popular among the farmers that we interviewed for last year for our SFI report but the thing is that this needs to be done really carefully uh, as is outlined in the um, top performing farmers work your business needs to be on a sound footing at the in this first place otherwise you'll just be diversifying your problems instead of your actual enterprises and if you click on please there's also other emerging options as well carbon markets and other opportunities from private investment I'm not going to talk too much about carbon markets here because um, Sarah is going to take you through that in a bit. So you can, you know, that's another sort of opportunity that you can think about, about you know, plugging that gap and using in combination with what we've just talked about here. If you click on please. So ultimately, there's no, there's no really one solution to see um, to answer everything. It's going to see everyone. It's not a one size fits all solution. You're going to see it's about seeing what's available and seeing what's right for you and your farm and make sure that you've got all the information to help you do that. So what we're going to do, we did that big piece of work last year. We're going to keep looking at these new schemes um, in detail and analyze them based on the evidence and see what it means for farmers and feed the results back to you and to also to policymakers. So last year, the work that we did, um, we're encouraged to see that you know the payment rates have gone up because that's one of the things that we highlighted, that the payment, right, payment rates were not enough for partners to... Um, make a profit or to incentivize them to take part in these schemes so we're, it's good that it's going in the right direction but we're going to keep on looking at these and providing that feedback to make sure that these schemes can be the best that they can be for our levy payers thanks very much for listening and i'll pass back to david i think thank you i'm indeed for going through that and um, explaining the, the current situation on sfi and elms to everyone and um, thank you to meg 
Lily Lancy for that market outlook earlier. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sarah Baker, our head of economic analysis, to talk through carbon markets and where the world lies there and what the opportunities are next. So, Sarah. Over to Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, David, and um, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining our spring grain market outlook this morning. So, understanding carbon markets is a relatively new work stream for economics and analysis. We started looking at this in the middle of last year, and you might wonder why AHDB are concerned with carbon markets. Well, a number of reasons. When I go out and on farm and when I'm at meetings and I talk to farmers, I've heard them variously described as the Wild West, which you're probably familiar, familiar with, um, the emperor's new clothes. Um, and I'm usually asked, what's the relevance to farming? And I think this is the angle that we're coming at it from here in, um, here in uh, economics and analysis. We are addressing that, that knowledge gap. And in economics, we call that asymmetry of knowledge. We're addressing the fact that it seems very clear to us that the buyers of these carbon credits, um, if you like, the, some of the big businesses who are using agricultural uh, carbon credits to offset some of their emissions know a great deal more about the value of these credits um, than the sellers. And if you think about one of the main reasons for HDB's existence to ensure that our levy payers can make informed business decisions, we want to address that asymmetry of knowledge. We want to ensure that all our levy payers have the, the right information to make the right business decisions. We're absolutely not in the, in the market for giving advice about carbon markets. Um, every business decision will uh, be individual, depending on your own particular circumstances. But we really do want to address some of these information gaps around these rapidly emerging markets. Um, we're very distinct from our environment team. They're looking at the how-to. How do you reduce emissions? Uh, what fee types can you use? What farming practices can you use in order to reduce your emissions? We're looking at it in exactly the same way that Millie and Ant and Meg and, and Amadeep have looked at the market today. Um, and we're looking at carbon as a, a resource on your farm and the likely trajectory of that market. Next slide, please. So very briefly today, I'm going to go through what are carbon markets, why do they matter to farmers, how do they work, and then I'm going to have a brief canter through the DEFRA nature markets framework and some of our key messages to our levy pairs as they stand. Next slide, please. So carbon markets are essentially a, a trading system. So um, these carbon credits, if you like, that are generated through uh, reducing emissions in some way or sequestering uh, more carbon on farm can be sold in the market. Um, there are voluntary schemes and they allow the emitters to, um, the, the, the big emitters, big business, if you like, to purchase these carbon credits uh, from farmers and there are regulatory schemes. Um, the EU emissions trading scheme was the one that we did belong to pre-Brexit and, and post-Brexit that has morphed into the UK emissions trading scheme and that is backed and verified by government and I'll come on to that verification system a little bit later on. So you've got the voluntary schemes which are pre predominantly um, effective in agriculture because the UK emissions trading scheme has not been extended to the agricultural sector. You've got regulated schemes within the voluntary se sector and they include uh, Peatland Carbon Code and the Woodland Carbon Code, but most of these voluntary schemes are uh, set up by private businesses. Next slide please. So why do they matter to, to farmers? Well, we all know we've, the government has set us uh, net zero emissions targets and they're internationally um, uh, agreed targets and their commitments that the government has made on a, an international level. And the goal here is to meet net zero as a nation by 2050. The NFU has set goals for agriculture for England and Wales to meet net zero by 2040. Um, in the background to that, you've heard from Amandeep the, the major changes that are going on with agricultural policy at the moment and the additional income sources that may be available under the new domestic policy. Uh, and we class these carbon markets as a potential additional income stream. 
Um, we also see that, uh, that that using some of the practices that can generate these carbon credits um, can improve the soil health, crop quality, and uh, can add to the productivity, can add to the the overall efficiency of our of our land use over time. So carbon matters in a in a number of ways to farmers, both in the fact that that there are going to be demands on farmers to meet certain criteria for their own emissions, but they also are managing an incredibly valuable resource within their own businesses. Next slide, please. So how do the voluntary carbon markets work? Well, the, uh, the, the project developers, which are the farmers, if you like, uh, uh, work on farm to um, remove or avoid emissions and then the standards bodies will come in and audit that in some way and a carbon credit will be issued. They can be sold by brokers uh, and the end buyers, they may be um, uh, the likes of uh, Ryanair buying up carbon credits to offset their various flights everywhere, but, but most businesses have now had a, a pledge to reduce their emissions and they will buy these credits in order to offset their own uh, carbon footprint, if you like. Um, so you can see the simple economics there. You can see at a, at, at a glance that you've got a key driver there. You've got a huge demand here um, with economic growth, with uh, businesses constantly expanding and uh, GDP expanding, you can see that the, those emissions are growing um, steadily throughout time, but there's a limit to the amount of carbon that can be uh, produced, if you like, the carbon credits, there's a, reduce, there's a, a limit to the reduction in um, uh, in, in, in the carbon emissions on farms. So you've uh, immediately, you can see that demand is outstripping supply, and those of you that are familiar with economics, that would suggest that the price would go up. Next slide, please. So why is there this price disparity? We can see, we, we know that the price of the, the UK emissions trading scheme, the, the um, European emissions trading scheme, um, the trajectory is generally upwards and it's widely agreed that the price of carbon is, uh, is on the up. And yet if we look at the schemes, if we look at the compulsory schemes that are regulated and verified by government, um, we can see that they have very different prices to these uh, voluntary carbon schemes. And in our opinion here at HDB, we think that the it, it's down in large part to less robust monitoring and verification methods. So it's the quality of the carbon credits that are being issued on farm. The market is a little bit sceptical about some of these voluntary markets and therefore they're priced accordingly. Now DEFRA have clearly come to the same conclusions that we have with HDB and they've announced the Nature Markets Framework to address this issue, to have a look at um, and introducing more rigour into these uh, voluntary markets. They, they see the private market as incredibly valuable and an essential partner to the uh, to, to the public markets that Amandeep has been talking to you about earlier, the SFI and local nature recovery, um, but they want to increase the rigour in this market. So I'm going to have a brief look at the nature of markets framework. Next slide, please. It's intended to scale up existing markets and DEFRA want to work with BSI to start developing uh, a range of standards. So our role here is um, to, to make sure that farmers are aware what's on offer, how to access those markets, um, what's in the government schemes, what's in the private market schemes, and continue to support the industry by providing information. So this is our reason for working in these markets. Next slide, please. If we look at the DEFRA Nature Markets Framework, um, the market rules, they've got clear rules about stacking and bundling. They've got clear rules about different credits or units that can be issued on the same ecosystem for the same piece of land. And Amadeep spoke about that. SFI can be compatible with countryside stewardship. Um, also, uh, you, can, you can enter SFI and sell your carbon provided you're not doing, you're not being paid twice for the same actions, if you see what I mean. So if you if you were to enter uh, the natural flood management, you can also enter carbon trading, but it's got to pass the stacking bundling and the additionality test. What addition is, 
uh, the market getting in terms of uh, reduction in emissions or generation of carbon credits for entering into that scheme? Would it have happened anyway without the without the funding? And if it passes that test, you can combine these different schemes on your on, on your farm. This is complex, and there's a huge amount of information available on our website in order to go through it. I'm, a, I'm aware that this is a a whistle stop tour through carbon markets. So I'll be keen to take your questions afterwards. The next slide. If you look at the um, core principles of nature uh, nature markets, it is this additionality. Um, what extra? What are what are farmers doing in addition to what they would be doing normally within their business um, that they are going to now be paid for? Um, Michael Gove famously called them these public goods, if you like. No double counting. Um, robust quantification, delivery of lasting benefits, um, so that carbon is sequestered and it stays there for a, for a, a length of time. We need transparency in these markets between buyers and sellers, and we need a secure validation and verification against an appropriate um, baseline. These are the things that have been identified, if you see, in nature markets that need addressing um, in order to secure that integrity, to ensure that quality um, of, the, uh, of the carbon certificates generated and ensure that farmers do benefit from the value of the carbon within their own businesses at the moment. So, what are our key messages? Next slide. What are our key messages to, to farmers? What should you do now? Um, and again, I said very clearly at the beginning, we're not in the business of giving advice because that advice will vary so widely from business to business. So what, what if you like, is the no regret decision making now? What, what um, can't have a downside, if you see what I mean, in this rapidly emerging and, and, and um, volatile market? Well, the first thing is measure your carbon footprint now. Uh, find a suitable tool for your business, and there are a range of calculators out there, uh, and start measuring now, because then you can be sure that any improvement that you uh, that you can demonstrate with your uh, calculator, you will get the benefit from. Once you've got a tool, stick with the same one, because although the measurement of tools, and this is widely discussed out there, will give you a different baseline, what you're measuring is the change from that baseline, and, and therefore you don't want to be chopping and changing calculators. Once you've found one that suits your business, you, you, you stay with it. You then need to fully understand the likely requirements, both present and future, for your own business um, and, and, and make sure that's accounted for within your business. Before you start selling the credits, make sure that you're not going to make a costly mistake in selling them at a price now and having to buy them back in to offset your own emissions at some point in the future. Um, really make sure that you, you know what's coming down the track. Um, explore the range of options and schemes available out there. Make sure you're fully, fully availed of all the information out there and take expert advice to determine what's right for your business. And if you go on to our next slide, what I would strongly recommend you do to, to sort of upskill yourself and to address that knowledge gap, that knowledge asymmetry that I referred to in my first slide is go on to our HDB carbon markets page and have a read through the information that our analysts have been digging out on your behalf. Exactly what you need to know about these markets, why it matters to your business and how to get involved and the answer to your frequently asked questions on carbon markets. So a very quick canter through carbon markets. I hope I've addressed your, your, uh, your questions about why HDB are operating in this market and exactly what to expect from economics and analysis talking about carbon markets going forward. But I welcome your questions. And at this point, I'm going to hand back to David. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm confident we could probably spend the next hour delving into carbon markets and, and questions. So thank you for, for just giving us the headlines and the and the, uh, the key elements of it there. I think it was a, a really useful discussion, something that we've um, definitely spurred a few questions and I'll I'll come back to you on those questions in a minute, Sarah, but I'll, I'll go back to some of our previous speakers, if that's OK, just to give you a break. And we'll head back to the first presentation that we had from Meg, Anthony and Millie. And um, Anthony, actually, there's a, there's a question that's come through for you regarding the um, oilseed market and if the Brazilian record bean crop is driven by um, yield growth or area growth. So what's driving that um, that record production? Um, well, David, what's driving that is is, is both. 
Um, for this marketing year, the area was up 5% and the yields are, are in, very good as well, despite the La Nina that we mentioned at the um, in the presentation. It didn't really impact Brazil too much, maybe a little bit in Rio Grande do Sul, which is the southern part of the grown region of Brazil in the south. But other than that, yields have been, um, well, not, not all on record, but in part on record. Great. Thank you. Um, so moving on um, to some other questions that have come through. Um, we've got one here, Millie, for you, I believe, looking at the price of natural gas, as, as you mentioned, um, saying that um, pre-pandemic prices of natural gas were about 40 pence per therm. And just asking what levels we're at now and, and how do you think um, that could possibly rise when Asian markets come into the mix? Yeah, sure. So um, pre-pandemic levels, we saw natural gas at around like 40 pence per therm mark. Um, actually, during sort of 2021, um, and the pandemic was obviously ongoing, but due to the lack of demand, we actually saw um, natural gas or UK nearby natural gas futures drop down to even like as low as the teens um, in terms of like, 16 pence per therm. Um, then sort of as the pandemic was ending and as infl inflation started rising due to the sort of the supply and demand balance um, with everything in terms of pandemic was greater demand um, and less supply. We saw inflation rise and we saw natural gas prices start to tick up again. That was obviously then before sort of the catalyst um, when we saw um, the invasion of Ukraine and prices completely go um, skyrocketing and go up to the um, around, if not over the 600 um, pence per therm, which is phenomenal, record highs. Um, Today, they're currently sitting at around the mid-90 pence, so just under the, um, the 100 pence per therm mark, and they have been for the last few weeks, which is the first time since um, pre-war levels, really, that we've seen this sustained period of under the 100 pence per therm. How high they will go again, again, is a bit of a sort of, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball and can't um, forecast there what actually is going to happen in terms of how high they will go when um, when the Asian demand sort of picks up. but in terms there's quite a lot of other fundamentals to put, um, factor in as well so like sort of the gas storage etc in europe as well as actually going ahead into winter sort of um the way that we saw gas in europe as we sort of preempt what's going to happen with weather and if for example it's colder or um, milder etc you know that will impact supply so we will either have lower or higher supply which again will influence prices but it's likely we could see some volatility in prices. So I, I highly, um, it's highly unlikely, um, I'm not going to put money on it, but it's highly unlikely we'll see it go back up to the 600 pence per therm as it stands at the moment. But we could see that slight uncertainty and prices come like creep back up a bit if we do see that stronger demand. Because in Europe as such, with sort of obviously we, we were so used, to, we did, we're not very sort of self-sufficient in terms of gas supply. So we obviously were very reliant on the Nord Stream 1 supply. That was cut off. We saw that huge um, price spike um, back in August. Um, then we sort of building relationships, etc., with the US and Finland supplying liquid, liquid natural gas. But actually, in Europe and domestic, we don't actually have the sort of the long-term infrastructure at the moment um, for sort of gas storage and gas supply. Um, until that's built up, there isn't a certainty or sort of to be able to get that supply level or the, the, the certainty, sorry, to get that supply level there. Um, so there will be that sort of additional volatility. Um, going forward. Great, right. thank you, Millie. And um, it's interesting with where fertilizer prices are heading at the moment. Obviously, we had some um, French prices that were released, um, I think, towards the end of last week and sort of mid 300 euros. And there's expectations yeah. that the domestic prices might be similar. And it's it's still pointing to a period of um, tight margins, whichever way we whichever way we look at it. Yeah, definitely. I think, like you say, prices fert prices will likely keep coming down with natural gas, but like looking at it now it's unlikely that they will go drop back to what we would know or more typical levels we had seen in previous years i think we're sort of this is now the new normal for at least the short to midterm anyway great thank you thank you millie thank you for answering that one um and meg if i can come to you um from a, a grain perspective from a wheat perspective specifically looking to the us uh, we've got a question here saying that there's a lot of stories about how poor the winter wheat condition is um of us crops uh, how spring wheat planting is being delayed because of weather. Um, so the question, I suppose, is, is it our view that if the much larger planted area, will it easily compensate for the poor weather conditions and poor growing conditions that we've seen in the US? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And it also allows me to talk a little bit more about this because it is something definitely we've been looking at. 
the past couple of months. Um, in terms of the fact that we know the area is due to be about 9% up, so you know it is a substantial increase in that area, and you know a lot of that is winter wheat, that spring wheat plantings are due to be down, you know, slightly on the year. Um, so you know that's the fundamental of you know the area data. In terms of the crop conditions, this is something we've been following really closely. Um, and something we'll continue to follow. At the moment, the good to excellent condition overall is at 26%. You know, that's, that is really quite low. Um, you know, increasing concerns about dry conditions. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the key thing that we've been looking at, you know, Kansas um, it is under a period of you know, extreme drought, and that's a key wheat producer. But we've been doing you know, quite a bit of analysis and looking at you know, drought conditions across the US. You know, when you compare back to this time last year, this time you know, two years ago, you, there was a lot more extreme drought, you know, widespread across the US. Um, and also when we've done you know, looking back at your know, correlations between crop conditions and, and yields that come out at the end, you know, we haven't come to you know, huge conclusions of the really strong correlation you know we're seeing markets move every day on you know, news around you know, weather you know, more favorable ra you know, rain improving conditions you know, potential for it to improve those conditions um so yeah certainly really great question and it also has allowed me to talk a little bit more about that so it's something that we'll be watching but, you know that area is increased the drought conditions you know, aren't quite as widespread as potentially we've seen in the past couple of seasons and um, and you know we're going off that basis but it It'll be something that we continue to watch, you know, a key watch point for us. Thanks. And, and there's another question that's come through actually that kind of slightly takes that um, point a little bit further. Um, so you've spoken there about the, the US side of things and kind of the issues there. Um, but the question was also saying that um, European wheat is being priced at sort of below average pricing levels, UK wheat is being very competitively priced towards export levels. Um, so considering there's a, already this sort of um, very low level of, of, of a uh, price of wheat, especially relative to corn, um, is the, the sort of more bearish market being driven specifically from the, the wheat market fundamentals, or is it being driven from the, the, the corn market fundamentals? I think the outlook looks to be, you know, both. I think, you know, from our understanding is the EU, UK, you know, um, looking at IGC data as well, you know, wheat opening stocks look, look to be up on the year, you know, EU especially, you know, the wheat balance is, it's, um, consultancy strategy grains, you know, say that it will be heavy. Um, and looking forward, you know, those production outlooks look pretty strong. I know there's some concerns in the EU, in Spain, for example, uh, but those wheat production numbers look strong. Um, so, you know, supply is there. And I think, you know, it's a really valid point about maize as well, um, because we have been, you know, relatively tight outlook for maize. Um, you know, I think going forward with that production outlook, you know, looking to rebound that potentially also might move the floor of the grain market down slightly as well, you know, going forward. There's a lot of caveats around demand, you know, the demand side, especially on the maize uh, front specifically. But yeah, I my understanding, you know, a bit both in that, in, I completely understand about the question, you know, in terms of wheat relating to maize, but hopefully that's answered it. Cool, great. Thank you, Meg. Um, and Millie, sorry, I, I realised there was another question on fertiliser I should have um, added on to my uh, questions earlier, so sorry for, for missing it, but with regards to um, what we've already been talking about in terms of the you know, recent history of fertiliser prices and grain prices, um, the question is if there's any indications of changes to levels of fertiliser and nitrogen fertiliser application given the high costs over the last 10 months, um, and if there are any significant changes expected, if that would have any impacts on, on yield and quality for the, the 23 crop. So yeah, sure. So we've been definitely hearing anecdotal reports of um, reduction in um, an application um, to like minim minimise the cost. And we actually even heard that at the back end of the 2022 crop, they were um, with quite a lot of growers not actually um, applying their last application, partly because it was too hot anyway and there was no water for the uptake. Um, and we saw actually those that did, the, it was in some regions it was almost void because actually it was so dry and um, warm that actually the sort of the usage of nitrogen was um, sort of the, the protein of the crop wasn't um, there. I think we have been hearing this year certainly and in our crop conditions report that um, ADES carry out for us, I've been hearing reports of 
of that reduction or a slight reduction in some areas and some growers. Um, but I think it's balanced um, out depending on sort of what crops, et cetera, and what, again, is, is, is understanding and managing those margins. So actually, um, I think a few have been looking at sort of what the total overheads are, what the actual impact would be to their um, production with the reduction of um, applications. Um, I think we could see if there has been a widespread um, reduction in application, we could see that slightly impact um, protein um, and potentially yield. But it's just too early to say yet, because obviously we are sort of it, we're approaching that part, aren't we, where crop development is key um, and weather is key. So there are other factors as well as fertilizer application that would impact yield. And we saw that last year where, like I say, the last application didn't necessarily actually work in some areas um, or wasn't useful in some areas for the wheat crop because of the weather um but yields were still fabulous um and this year for example, we have quite a prolonged wet period we've had quite a prolonged wet march um and april um so far you know we could see um that sort of have a more of an impact on crops necessarily than um nitrogen application but in theory if we did see a reduction it could have an impact but i think there are bigger factors um to play especially with weather this year Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm conscious of time. We've only got five minutes left, so I just want to make sure we cover off a few questions um, for the other areas that have come through as well. So, Amandeep, it's OK if I come to you with a question um, now. I think that the question really is focusing on the, the um, if you could just um, give some clarity around whether the information that you were giving earlier was with regards to a, a gross or net income. Um, so could you just clarify you know, the numbers you were talking about with regards to the SFI payments, if that was on a gross or a, or a net level? Yeah, so um, we worked out the, it was a net payment that you get, the total net payment. So we took into account costs that you would incur from doing these actions. So, for example, if you had to do soil tests, we put in the you know, cost of the soil test, the labour, the amount of time it would take to do those soil tests. Or if you were putting in like a margin, a flower margin, the cost of the seeds, example, the drilling cost for it's associated per hectare to do that. And we factored all of that in. Um, specifically then, um, for sort of like the integrated uh, pest management standard, one thing that I think um, labor payers should watch out for is obviously there's a stand, there's an action in there which um, looks at um, sowing a legume fallow or legume, and it kind of differs if you're doing it on arable land or grassland. So you got a much higher payment on arable land of 102 pounds per hectare compared to 500, um, sorry, 593 pounds per hectare compared to about 102 pounds per hectare for um, arable land. And when when we were doing the calculations, it didn't make sense for me to do that. Um, but on our farms and the virtual farms to do that on that specific farm because my cost was outweighing my um the amount I was going to get in per, per hectare so i'm just saying it's just like to show that there's all these things to look out for see what works for you and what works best because you can really get into the detail really and look at what all the information available to make the best decision for your farm great thank you um and then sort of moving on to a slightly different topic i think sarah this might be a, a bit of a question for you um specifically about biodiversity net gain um, and for certain developers using farmland that's going to become um, mandatory for later this year. So I think that the question is really asking um, if there's a growing level of interest for developers looking for farmland to provide biodiversity units, is AHDB doing any analysis around what that could mean for farmers and growers, I suppose just what's in our sort of general plans for looking at the economics of biodiversity net gain going forwards? Um, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and again, from my sort of travels around the country, I've spoken to farmers who are already entering this market and have uh, have, have sold land for biodiversity net gain. But but yes, as you know, builders will now be required um, from October to to show a, um, a net gain on any new developments. And that means they don't have to do it necessarily within that development, but what they do have to they have to net off any impact of that of that development against, um, you know, a positive uh, biodiversity gain somewhere else in the country. And this is another example, again, of the asymmetry of knowledge um, that the farmers need to understand what a, exactly what a valuable resource they have uh, there within their farm businesses. And if they do decide to sell, that they are selling it at the right price for the right length of time to the right buyer, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely, um, as we as we uh, progress through our analysis of carbon markets, we will be going into uh, the biodiversity markets, we'll be going into um, BNG and we'll be exploring all of those natural capital markets as well as green finance and as well as um, some of the public private partnerships in order to make sure that each, each levy payer is, is fully informed. It's difficult to comment on individual circumstances, um, but again, having that information at your fingertips and knowing where to go to find the, the, 
the bits that you need to know before you make a decision, I think is is absolutely our role in this in this market. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to put you on the spot now, Sarah, because this is our last question with regards to the time. Um, so I'm going to uh, probably ask for a brief answer, for probably a question that can't necessarily be given a brief answer. I'm going to give you an impossible task here, I'm afraid. Um, so looking at carbon markets um, specifically, um, if we think about um, the question I think is asking that you know, customers, so end, end receivers of grain in terms of the instance that we're here today, will be looking to assess their overall carbon footprinting. And including scope three emissions, essentially looking at the footprint of the crop production. So if on-farm carbon credits have been sold, what information do we think should be provided to the customers in relation to the crops sold to them? Should it be the actual level of CO2 impact, etc.? So what kind of, I suppose, what kind of CO2 or what kind of carbon information needs to be passed through the supply chain? Um, I, I think that's um, yeah you're right it's a it's a tricky question it needs it comes back to that principle of nature markets it needs to be transparent it needs to be um, robustly measured and then it needs to be the information needs to flow through the supply chain um, you, you, you're quite right that with scope three uh, that the recipients of that grain the supply chain will be looking back to farmers to ensure that they can um, verify the uh, the carbon credentials of the the product that they are passing on uh, and those requirements you know to demonstrate that will sit will sit with the farmer so um, so it is about that um, the robust measurement which comes back to our measuring it now um, make sure that you can pass that information on understanding the difference between insetting and offsetting if you're selling carbon credits if you're selling them within the supply chain versus if you're selling them outside there is a difference in in, in accounting in in that stream um, and make sure that that information is a, you know is is as robust and credible as as possible Thank you, Sarah, um, and thank you to all of our speakers. I'm afraid we've run out of time, so we'll have to wrap it up there. So Sarah, Amandeep, Millie, Anthony, Megan, thank you for your presentations and for your insight this morning. Um, thanks for everyone that has attended. At our peak, we had um, 248 people that were attending today, so that's a great number. Thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Again, one final plug for our planting and variety survey that will be starting later this week. And as ever, if you have any questions, if you have anything that you want to understand more of, or if there's anything that you feel that we should be doing as AHDB in the area of market analysis, carbon markets, that global policy and, and government policy and trade deals area, then feel free to please get in contact and talk to us about it. We are all ears wanting to learn what information we can provide for levy payers. So again, I'll say thank you for your time. Thank you for our presentations this morning. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm sure you will have found it as informative as I have. And I hope you have a very good rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.